interest in whiteness have been long fought in education. Schools have historically been the battleground for testing the property interest in whiteness, starting from around the Board of Education, going up to Gruder and everything in between. Despite numerous court decisions aimed at promoting equal access to education, schools are segregated and unequal, and in some cases more segregated and more unequal than ever. The ubiquity of educational inequity is further exacerbated by the increasing use of criminalization to remedy minor incidents of schoolyard misconduct. This trend is especially, especially problematic because students of color have borne the brunt of student overcriminalization. This trend toward increased criminalization serves to funnel students of color outside of the education realm into pockets of society dictated by increased social control. This phenomenon gives support to the theory that white fears about black criminality and property interest in maintaining racial exclusion may lead to the increased social control of blacks. So during the presentation, I'm gonna start with a video. Um, it involves a case that the ACLU has worked on with a student um, named Kyle Thompson. And I can just use that video as um, and it has a, a case study or an example of how, the way that this actually plays out in practice. Then I'm gonna speak a little bit more broadly about the school to prison pipeline. Then I'm gonna conclude by discussing why whiteness as property is a um, useful framework for thinking about this issue and uh, exploring why um, it's actually occurring. Are you ready? Okay. My name is Kyle Thompson. I like playing football, playing video games, hanging out with my friends. The vice principal said if I had a school full of kids like yours, I'd be the happiest man in the district. Kyle's a very sensitive kid. I mean, he's, he's fun to coach. He's fun to be around. For somebody with his personality to get in this kind of trouble is so shocking to me. I didn't see it coming. I could never have imagined this. Just don't face value. I can't, I just, I find it hard to believe. I had a list in my bag of, um, it was called, it was titled Hit List, but it wasn't really to hurt anybody. And my friend took it out of my notebook. I saw him take it out, so I took it back from him. And my teacher came over and she took it from me. And I got up and I grabbed the paper and we were pulling it back and forth. All the witness statements said the teacher was laughing, the teacher was playing, we were all laughing, we were all playing. When we were pulling it back and forth, she was laughing at first, so I thought it was just as a joke. But she got serious and I let go. And she left the class. And then the hall monitor came and then they escorted me to the office. The principal told the police officer to take me to the police station. 
And the scariest part was probably being handcuffed to inside of there. I felt that I deserved maybe a couple days of suspension at most, but I didn't think it was really 180 days worth of, of a consequence. When there's activities up at the school, he can't attend. He can't go watch his sister. He can't watch his you know, former teammates play. I can't play football. Um, so really, I just throw the football around with my friends, play video games, watch TV, but I don't really see my friends as much. Here I am now, thousands of dollars later, six, seven months down the road, and all day long when I'm gone, I worry about Kyle. My son has gotten progressively depressed. I still see remnants of like the old Kyle, but there's a sadness there and that kills me. I want him to be back in school. I need him to be in a school building around other children. It seems like it'll be, it'll be pretty hard going back after being out of school for a long time. But it's something I would like to do. So Kyle's story, there are many stories like Kyle throughout the country. And the school to prison pipeline is a nationwide trend of funneling poor uh, minority students out of the education system and into the criminal justice system. Um, this comic by the Youth Justice Coalition illustrates the paradox of the school to prison pipeline. There are insufficient funds for decent education, but there are plenty of funds for incarceration. Thus, we ship students into the criminal justice system to deal with them. When I'm speaking about criminalization, I'm using a very broad definition, and I'm including student exclusion, which includes suspensions, expulsions, as well as referrals um, to the criminal justice system. That's because they all feed into the criminal justice system, and they're part of a pipeline, where, whereas these students are being placed into it. The student, the school, to be clear, the school to prison pipeline is a general problem. It doesn't just affect um, poor students and students of color. All students are being affected by it. It has been a problem since the late 90s and early 2000s, and for several reasons. Um, one, of the, one of the problems um, is related to zero tolerance policies that have been adopted in the criminal justice system. You can find them being translated into the educational context. Another high, high profile um, incidence of school violence that took place in schools. However, the, the, the interesting thing here is that as these uh, zero tolerance policies have been adopted, there's actually been a decrease in student criminal behavior in classrooms. So several you know, scholars have found, Russ Skiba and Hirschfeld and others, have found that you know, actually students are behaving better than they have in the past. And despite that, they're being criminalized um, more than they have in the past. So just to give you an example, in 2006 in Pittsburgh, the school district there experienced a 46% increase in school-based arrest in a single year. So this, this issue is happening rapidly and quite quickly, and it's a quite recent uh, phenomenon. Some of the ways that the school-to-prison pipeline manifests itself is through the widespread adoption of zero tolerance policies, dramatically increase student exclusion through expansion, ex, excuse me, through suspensions and expulsions, increase referrals to the juvenile justice and criminal justice system, increase school-based arrests, and increase referrals to disciplinary alternative education schools. And I, I think it's important to focus on schools, you know, because of, you see the wider issues around power reproducing themselves within the school. Um, Foucault has stated that power is everywhere and it re reproduces itself. He recognized that schools are a site for social control and site for reproduction of larger societal issues. Like in the criminal justice system, persons of color lose out the most, particularly black males, in this system of increased social control and over-criminalization. 
So even when controlling for misbehavior, attitudes, parental involvement, economic disadvantage, and school organization, black students are punished more harshly. There's something about race. The black exclusionary rate is two to four times more than that of whites. And you know, one way of ex trying to understand why this is happen happening might be the racial threat hypothesis. And this hypothesis we found coming out in around the 1960s, starting with sociologists like Blaylock. Um, and what it states is that as the pro proportion of blacks increase in the population, the social controls that are used over them will also increase. So the racial threat um, hypothesis has been tested through the years, and you know it's more or less has been supported, although it's very contextual. So you find that in the North, it's especially prevalent. Um, you find that it's very prevalent in racially diverse cities where there's a lot of integration. Um, you also find where there is concentrated disadvantage. So where you have a higher um, population of blacks, you find that there's more social control, more criminalization of them. Um, more recently, uh, Kelly Welch and Allison Payne have found, you know, within the, exploring this issue within the educational context, found that you know, the percent of blacks is positively and significantly correlated to the level of social control within that school. So schools that have more black students tend to have more zero tolerance policies, tend to criminalize students more, they're less likely to adopt non punitive approaches to discipline, which might be a, a simple refer to um, guidance counselor, for example. But uh, the same study found that drug use and student misbehavior had no correlation to the policies being adopted. So the, what this really shows that is that race matters. You know, the racial factor is significant in particular, and I think it's important to, to, to remember that. So this chart is from the Office for Civil Rights, and it just highlights the ways that um, you know, racial minorities are being um, criminalized more than um, white students. So um, this data um, in red you'll see pertains to the black students, and the light blue pertains to um, white students. And you see 20% of black males have had out of school suspensions, whereas only 7% of white males have. And you also find um, with American Indians, 12% have been um, suspended. For females, you find a similar trend. So white females have only been suspended, 3% have been suspended, whereas for black females, 11% more than three times um, the figure. And so you see the ways that race plays, plays out um, in, in this problem. And I think um, it, you know, it, in part of thinking about this, we have to think about you know, whiteness and what sort of interests are being protected by the marginalization of students. So this comic that I chose here, I think represents pretty well how you know, white privilege operates. So in the first part of the, of the comic, you see white man has enslaved a black man and said, you know, this is for your own benefit. And he climbs on top of him, and benefits from the slavery and oppression of him, right, and gets to a higher ledge. And when he gets to this higher ledge, he says to him, hey, you know, I'm really sorry about that race discrimination stuff, you know, while he's enjoying his privilege on the higher ledge. And he looks down at the black guy, and the black guy says to him, okay, that's fine, why don't you pull me up on the ledge with you? And he responds, no, that would be reverse discrimination. And so what, what this, this comic highlights is the problem with white privilege. It allows white people to benefit from oppression, but you don't have to redress the oppression. So you're, you're benefiting from the past enslavement of blacks and the past oppression of blacks, but you're not doing anything to ensure that blacks are somehow redressed for that. As Richard Dyers has stated, white power secures its dominance by not seeming to be anything in particular. Whiteness has become part and parcel of the mainstream and therefore easily escapes suspicion. Whiteness is 
therefore, the underlying norm that has shaped the social conditions of the United States and permeates through all its institutions. Whiteness as property provides us with a useful analytical tool for understanding why whiteness is so pervasive. Whiteness as property provides us, provides for the right to use and enjoyment and the right to exclude, helps us understand the persistent expectation of continued privilege. The right to use includes the right to protect the reputational interests in whiteness. Inherent in this right to use within the school context are reputational interests premised on white equals good student, black equals bad student, and how these expectations play out in the way that black students are being marginalized at a higher rate than white students and being punished more. The property interests in the right to exclude non-whites is also key. Here it is concerned with setting boundaries, preserving segregation, and marginalizing students of color. So what the School of Prison Pipeline actually does is it encourages segregation and it pushes students out of the education system and it just subjects them to higher social control. In protecting the property interest in whiteness by over-criminalizing school children of color, there's several material benefits to whites. There's less resource competition in schools. It maintains segregation. It controls perceived threats to whiteness. So students who seem to be threatening um, social order within the school, it's an easy way of containing them and sending them out of the school system. It's a reproduction of societal social control. So you find that it's a reproduction of the mass incarceration of people of color in general and the criminalization of people of color in general. And another reason why it's important to think of whiteness as a property interest is it gives you certain expectations, certain rights. When you have a property interest, you expect to be free from being arbitrarily deprived of that property. And so that's where the notion of innocent whites come in. We see in affirmative action cases where the court is finding that you know, whenever you're trying to give some sort of treatment to redress the inequality that people of color face, then you have to deal with this issue of innocent whites. And what's implied in that um, argument is that they have a reasonable expectation in their continued use of their whiteness and that they're, they have an actual property interest in their whiteness and they cannot just be deprived of that. And that's the way that we think about property, that the idea that we have some due process rights before it's taken away from us. So I, I'd like to conclude with these remarks from Chief Justice Earl Warren from the Brown v. Board of Education. He said, in these days, it is doubtful that any child reasonably can expect to succeed in life if he is denied the opportunities of an education such an opportunity where the state has undertaken to provide it is a right that must be made available on equal terms. This statement still resonates, and in some manners, the condition of school children of color has deteriorated. Criminalizing students of color reminds us that race still matters. Radical change in education is needed. The overcriminalization of school children of color is at epidemic levels and we need to address the property interest in whiteness that promotes and beautifies itself in order to get to the root of the problem. Yeah. Right, thank you. Mm -hmm. The floor is open for questions. Mm -hmm. no, I mean, it's, it's a really fascinating project that you're working on, and obviously it's been kind of a perennial question throughout the like kind of modern school system. Um, you know, it's sort of so common yet so horrifying at the same time. Uh, there was a piece in the Washington Post, I think this past year, of um, women writing, I had it in my ever notes here, so yeah. So my son has been suspended five times. He's three. <laughs> and, you know, it was this sort of, a, her son's a nursery school, yeah, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, she didn't really think, you know, didn't really know what to think of it um, until, you know, as a black parent, she mentioned it to some of the white parents, and they were like, oh, no, my son's, you know, nothing's ever happened to any of our children. Mm -hmm. um, 
So it's just another, as you say, it all sort of feeds into each other in different ways. Um, and yeah, this is, you know, preschooler. Um, and from a, you know, relatively like upper middle class professional black woman who has a certain amount of access to things, mm -hmm. but still has you know, a black son who's going to face these stereotypes that, yeah, come in even when you're just dealing with a three year old. So what has been the political, I mean, the legal recourse that can be taken to help students like the kid in the video or um, students who are constantly being, uh, you know, take, removed from school? Is there, I mean, is there a legal recourse or is it that your hands are pretty much tied because of school policies? No, there, there, there is legal resource. Um, the question is whether legal, re you know, legal traditional legal re recourses will be enough to really deal with the issue. But there are. So we have with the ACLU, they've um, instituted you know numerous lawsuits um, dealing with this issue. So I worked at the ACLU maybe a few years ago, and one of the one case, for example, that I worked on involved in disciplinary alternative education school in Atlanta. And that school was just, you know, terrible. And basically what they would do is, you know, students who aren't performing well on tests or students who are, you know, may perhaps have disabilities or, and, you know, there could be a host of reasons. They just send them to this school. That way they don't have to be accountable for them because these schools aren't accountable under No Child Left Behind Act. And so they can boost their test scores by putting the students there. But the problem was, you know, the type of education the students were receiving in school, they weren't being educated, they were just being put in, in front of computers the whole day. Um, the security at the school, which was horrendous, so they had to go through the medical detectors, but they had to be fully searched every day in school. Women, the female students had to shake their bras out every day when they were going into school in front of male, you know, student, and um, school resource officers. So all this stuff was happening, and you know we filed the lawsuit, and we, you know, entered a settlement, and we got the school closed down eventually. So there are legal resources, and there are um, are, are ways to deal with it, um, but it, it's it's challenging because the problem keeps keeps happening, it keeps repeating itself, even where a lot of those lawsuits are being are successful. And so there, there, there's a larger issue in terms of the way that black students are perceived. Um, I didn't go into this in the presentation, but I, you know, the socioeconomic status matters. It's a factor. But at times, um, I think that it's used as a way to state that, you know, the problem isn't us and we're not racist. The problem is them. You know, they're poor, therefore they don't have the right culture, they don't have the right attitude about it. And really the problem is race, like the, the system is racist. And so it, it's important to highlight that and emphasize that because I, I, I have gotten, you know, at times pushback about that. It's, you know, this is just a class issue, but it's not just a class issue. Mm -hmm. Because if you break down the numbers, it, mm -hmm. it, tres it trespasses mm -hmm. over class. Mm -hmm. Have you seen an increase in the um, suspension and expulsion of males of color or just um, children of color since the passage of NCLB? And yeah. if that has anything to do with the testing, you're trying to kick these students out so they don't have to test. Yeah, there has been. There has been. And so that's part of the issue in terms of whether it's, um, I mean, administrators have incentives now to get rid of these students. You know, that's what it, what it creates. You know, they get all sorts of incentives through it, um, you know, even direct financial incentives, depending on what their test scores are and the like. And we saw that in the Atlanta school district, that was one of the motivating factors. You know, if you get every student who doesn't do well in class or who's not performing as you would like, you just get rid of them, ship them to the same school, mm -hmm. and don't have to worry about accounting for them, then you know, it becomes really attractive. Or even referring them into the criminal justice system, and therefore they're in the juvenile justice system, you don't have to worry about them either. You mentioned um, that you said that traditional legal means won't cut it. I'd be interested to hear what non-traditional ideas you're thinking would help. I mean, we need something. Yeah. Give me something new. Uh, well, I, I'm still thinking about this, huh? Um, 
I'm, 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 I'm this, I guess what I'm working on, this is still an early draft for me, but I'm still thinking about I, I, I think, you know, encouraging restorative justice practices in schools um, is helpful. I think, you know, the change that we really need is, is a bit radical. Um, you know, we don't need a, a system where there's no child left behind. Um, that, that act, while it might be well-intentioned, the way that it operates is, is terribly. And so, I mean, not having that would be helpful. Um, and you know, there's, there's, there's a host of things that need to happen in terms of just even educating people in general about the issue and um, just, you know, getting people more informed, and even students, even their parents of color, um, about why this is problematic. Because what you find sometimes is they're the ones who encourage criminalization. They might say, we want metal detectors because we don't trust, you know. So even everyone internalizes this notion of black criminality and everyone perpetuates it. And so, you know, it's going to take a lot. All right, thanks. I think I'm out of time. <laughs> thanks a lot for that talk. Um, Okay, and we can come back to some of these questions at the end, which I look forward to doing. Um, okay, our next speaker is going to be. Can we go to that? I was excited. It was just closed. Okay, I let's. So I'll we'll be staying in school. All right, yeah. very good. Great idea. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I have a note. Yeah. Friends. Yeah. Thanks. All right, so hi, I'm Juliet uh, Williams. So, um, my viewers called whiteness as property. What's gender got to do with it? Um, so the question is, what does whiteness as property look like in the present moment? And my paper is really um, an attempt to extend Cheryl Harris's account of whiteness as property to examine more recent adaptations of law and public discourse that have arisen to assure the perpetuation of white privilege in the two decades since um, Harris's landmark article first appeared. Um, so what I'm going to do is suggest that recent debates surrounding um, a widely publicized boy crisis in the United States is itself an illuminating case study or a context in which to consider some of the distinctive strategies by which whiteness as property is once again regenerating itself in the contemporary period. So as we all know in, in Harris's article, you know, the story of whiteness of property in some sense is a story that stays the same, but it stays the same through legal transformation. So, you know, what's happened in the past 20 years. Um, Harris's concept of whiteness as property is particularly useful, I'm going to argue, in explaining how middle class white boys have come to achieve the status of a disadvantaged class in public education reform debates. And following Harris, I want to briefly highlight the role that law, in particular, has played not just in perpetuating, but also in masking the forms of white privilege that are promoted by contemporary boy crisis discourse. I contend that contemporary boy crisis discourse mobilizes the category of gender as a socially acceptable way to construct and administer difference in the context of programs that redirect not just public attention, but very scarce public education resources to middle class white boys. In this context, gender discourse has provided critical legitimacy to education reform policies that reposition privileged white boys as a disadvantaged class. And in demonstrating the way that claims about gender-based disadvantage are being deployed to retrench white privilege in US public schools, I want to highlight the analytic importance of bringing an intersectional perspective to bear on studies of whiteness. OK, so as we've all hopefully heard, um, you know, there are an abundance of proclamations in the media of a boy crisis. And those who herald the boy crisis argue that on really any conceivable measure of educational or social well-being, boys today are faring worse, much worse, in fact, than their female peers. So we've all heard these statistics that boys get worse grades in school, boys are more likely to be disciplined or expelled, 
boys are more likely to drop out of school, they're less likely to enroll in college, they're more likely to be diagnosed with ADD, with autism, with other challenging conditions. They're also more likely to be the victim of violent crimes and they're more likely to commit suicide. Contemporary boy crisis discourse, the kind of discourse that we hear today, is often traced back to the late 1990s in the US when uh, people like Christina Hoff Summers published her book, The War Against Boys, and there was a panic about the nation's boys that began to seize national headlines. Many purveyors of the 1990s boy crisis discourse pointed to evidence that they said suggested that in the wake of second wave feminist legal reforms, boys were now falling behind their female peers in school achievement, basically suffering neglect since the 1970s when an overcompensating feminist verb had created a situation in which boys were now disadvantaged. This boy crisis discourse that began to circulate in the 1990s was not exclusively a phenomenon in the US. It actually was pervasive across um, many countries in the English-speaking world, Australia, Canada, um, but also in Japan um, and elsewhere. And while this transnational ascent of a boy crisis discourse, often called the boy term, um, actually preceded the boy crisis discourse in the United States of the 1990s, um, we also have to understand the role that a distinctively US phenomenon played in um, elevating boy crisis discourse to the fore. And that was um, a, a movement that happened in the late 1980s and early 1990s that was specifically focused around addressing the crisis conditions facing boys of color, particularly those living in um, neglected urban centers. And I think that um, not enough attention has been paid to the way in which the earlier discourse of a black male crisis legitimated the notion of a boy crisis that then was deracialized as it became um, more uh, widely in circulation. And in fact, a, uh, this latter deracialized boy crisis discourse had the perverse effect of undermining attention to racial injustice as a cause of the crisis, even as it capitalized on the resonance that a boy crisis had based on what people earlier knew about what was happening uh, to boys of color in urban areas. So the version of the boy crisis that has predominated since the late 1990s centers white middle class boys as the primary subjects of um, redress, boys who are considered to be desperately in need of um, recognition. Now, of course, it's clear that when um, uh, claims about the boy crisis are made, rarely is the data broken down, as India very helpfully did, by um, uh, race, by class. And when the, so when we think about boys compared to girls, um, you know, those very crude metrics, when we break them down by race or class, of course, what we find is that, you know, some boys are in crisis and some boys are not. As one commentator has noted, particularly absent from the majority of boy debates in the United States is asking which boys. Asking this question leads to the revelation that race and class remain far better predictors of school success than is gender. And as such, the undifferentiated boy crisis discourse that nonetheless is very prominent in the United States holds the danger of further targeting resources to groups who are already the biggest winners at school, which would be white middle class boys. Okay, so white middle class boys, the only way they ever don't look good in the data is if you care, compare them to white middle class girls. Mm -hmm. But they do better than all other girls and all other boys, okay? So that's one of the problems here. Now, boy crisis discourse has been widely critiqued, particularly within the academy. Many commentators have um, characterized it as a strategy um, of recuperative masculinity, okay? So part of a kind of broader movement um, uh, that vilifies feminism as a primary cause of the suffering of men and boys, and we're all, I'm sure, familiar with the end of men hypothesis and the sort of perennial um, uh, panic about the diminishing, apparently, status of um, white male privilege. 
As education researcher Marcus Weaver Hightower observes, numerous suggestions have been made for correcting boys' real and perceived disadvantages. And like the debate's general tenor, a majority have been largely conservative, aimed at retrenching traditional hegemonic masculinities. So what this points to is the fact that many of the um, purveyors of boy crisis discourse, particularly within the realm of education, are arguing for reforms that will essentially retrench masculine privilege rather than um, uh, uh, transcend it. So things like um, that, uh, everything from advocating that teachers, that we segregate students on the basis of sex, that we um, reward boys for activity and de-emphasize certain forms of, of, of academic attainment, that um, more nonfiction as opposed to fiction is integrated in the classroom, and all kinds of um, um, efforts to address the situation that essentially serve to validate hegemonic masculinities rather than contest it. So, you know, I think it's quite, um, the recuperative masculinity framework has been quite a powerful tool for challenging um, boy crisis discourse, but I do want to suggest that the lens of whiteness as property needs to be brought to bear and that it does shed a very important light on the matter, growing into the relief the way that a gender-based discourse is serving to protect and promote um, white privilege. So. I want to suggest that the remarkable, really remarkable given the um, lack of empirical evidence, that the traction that boy crisis discourse has had in education stands as one powerful indication of the resilience of whiteness as property and as such invites consideration of the distinctive strategies that have enabled it. And in that regard, I just want to suggest that as I mentioned in the beginning, one of the strategies of boy crisis advocates has been to appropriate a social justice vocabulary. So to now, instead of adopting this kind of post-racial, colorblind notion to say, no, we believe there's disadvantage and there needs to be forms of affirmative action and white boys need to be the subject of it. And so um, I do think that much of the commentary on whiteness as property in the contemporary moment has focused on post-racialism and I think that is quite clearly a phenomenon, but I think that there are other strategies that are also proliferate that need to be interrogated, and this strategy of appropriation as opposed to denial is one that I want to draw um, attention to. Um, so, you know, just by way of conclusion, what I'm arguing here is that, you know, boy crisis discourse is implicated in showing up not just male privilege, but white privilege, and in saying that, I just want to insist on having an intersectional understanding of whiteness in the first instance. Um, you know, by invoking intersectionality, I think it does um, raise some interesting questions about the implications of the critique of boy crisis discourse. So, you know, as I've noted, many critics of boy crisis discourse say, we have to ask which boys, okay? Um, but the question is then is the implication of my argument that we need to reframe the boy crisis around boys of color, around black boys, is that what intersectionality demands? And I want to you know, issue a note of caution by way of conclusion. So if we think about, for example, President Obama's My Brother's Keeper initiative, you all may know that in recent months it's been subject to a lot of criticism from progressives, including Cheryl Harris. Um, arguing that a program like that risks a very problematic marginalization of the urgent, equally urgent problems facing girls of color, um, leading some critics such as Paul Butler, who's a legal scholar, um, to bluntly call it patriarchy masking as racial justice. So intersectionality theory demands, I think, that we consider the ways that a focus on the needs of black males and boys of color may obscure the crisis conditions that are facing black women and other women of color in a society that's long been organized around whiteness as property. Such programs, like My Brother's Keeper, risk enabling white privilege by obscuring the structural effects of racial injustice because when men of <coughs> color are placed at the center of the discourse, the totalizing effects of racism then become obscured, if not all um, denied. And you know, I do want in this regard to say that 
my point is not to deny that a devaluation of, of black masculinities is a particular strategy of whiteness as property. So to challenge my brother's keeper is not to deny the, that um, uh, racism is a gendered phenomenon, but it is to say that strategies to address that are going to prove counterproductive if they inadvertently may enable um, gender inequality within communities of color by setting up hierarchies there or by obscuring the pervasive effects of racism across communities of color regardless of issues of gender. That is all that I have for you, <laughs> friends. All right. Thank you. So we have a few moments for questions. Yeah. Um, I'm curious what your thoughts are on uh, Emma Watson's speech at the UN and at the He for She campaign, or the yeah, He for She campaign, and how that relates to um, to your paper. Yeah, tell me. You know, I'm, I just don't have yeah. same thing. So sure. So so Emma Watson, yeah, um, the actress. The actress. She, she is now like the UN ambassador for Goodwill, and she made the speech. Um, uh, Trumpeting the he for she campaign, which is which promotes um, feminism among men and boys, um, and she's really calling for you know more men to support the cause, and um, I feel I've heard that there's um, she's received a lot of flack in the progressive community um, for having a very white take on feminism, um, and. I am I'm just very curious about what your thoughts on on this whole um, controversy. Yeah, I mean that's a really great question. I mean, so right, there are paternalistic forms of feminism that have been, you know, that we might associate with certain white feminist formations. Sort of the other side of the coin of you know the internalized racism. So when you have a you know law and order sensibility being invited through you know metal detectors and stuff in the schools, you know, certainly, um, you know, anyone would want to, any feminist, I think, would want to say to Emma Watson, what are the implications of centering men as the primary agents of women's liberation in this moment, which is different from contesting the claim that sexism is not going to be overcome unless everybody, regardless of gender, is, is willing to, you know, um, carry that load. Um, so, you know, I'll have to look into that a little yeah. bit more. But I mean, I think that your question is a good one because just the one sort of polemical thing I'll say is that we've become very unreflexive about what intersectional analysis demands of us. So I think that, um, you know, my, my concern is that, you know, when you ask, well, why is it that it was Obama's administration that authorized you know, my brother's keeper. We can see that as a, on the one hand, a, a, um, you know, anti-racism 2.0. Like there's an intersectional consciousness that is really salutary there. You know, the recognition that racism is gendered. But we also have to see the way in which intersectionality requires not just attention to the specificity and multiplicity of identities, but an awareness of the politics that are engendered through those recognitions, you know, such that the way in which one chooses to contest black masculinity seems to be aware of its reinforcement of sexisms, that anti-racism cannot just be waged in a you know, single axis kind of manner. And Probably, you know, if I knew more about the Emma Watson thing, I'd say something like that. Yeah. yeah. I just wanted to say, I really like your presentation. I really love that, that idea about um, the intersectional piece of whiteness because even within the gender, right, is this notion that white males are supposed to do better than white females. Like they're supposed to be at the top, like whoever else is at the bottom or underneath them, right? And that when we talk about property, you know, the history of property is, is very patriarchal, right? That, you know, that women didn't have property or were, you know, considered their husband's property at the same time. So to bring in that, the gender piece, I think is really important. And also, um, 
with this, the whole My Brother's Keeper, you know, there's been this conversation about, you know, well, we should just get a, you know, like a separate piece for girls. And it's, it's very, um, it's very interesting because then it's like, we're still like trying to fix the victims, right? There's no institutional um, kind of um, works where we're saying that there are structures that are preventing or creating these crises versus let's try and, you know, let's, I don't know, everybody get on the field and carry a log and sing kumbaya and all, we're all black men. <laughs> and as if that's going to change it when it's not necessarily the kids that need the change. I mean, there's change all over, but that there are school structures and institutional pieces of police that need change. Like, where's the program? The whiteness program, right? To change the white, the, the perspective of that. So I really like mm -hmm. the way that you're thinking about it, and it's um, really powerful. Yeah, based on the uh, the critiques um, that you gave, what are your thoughts about kind of race conscious or gender conscious remedies? Um, because I think I think Obama's My Brother's Keeper is a good example of. Um, a conscious use of race and gender to try to, you know, um, put forth a potential kind of advocacy tool. But I think your critiques are spot on in the sense that it kind of gets lost in the intersectionality issue. So my, my thought is, like, where does the proper, I mean, is there innovative uses of race and gender that's actually making a more productive impact? Yeah, I, so I know we're out of time, but I'll just say quickly. So I just, by the way, I'm just writing a book about um, the movement for single-sex public education in the U.S. over the past 25 years, so 25 years ago, there were two single-sex public schools, grades K through 12 in the U.S., and now there's over a thousand schools that are segregated students on the basis of sex. Um, so, and and like there's over a thousand schools, so they're doing it in lots of different ways. Um, but you know, my my quick take is that you know I profoundly believe that. Um, racism is gendered, and of course, sexism is is racialized. And so, you know, like when we look at th this data, which I so appreciate that you have about overcriminalization, you know, we see that the ways, the strategies for discipline and control that are brought to bear on girls of color are not entirely distinct from boys of color. Like there's still the higher rates of of criminalization, but there's also other forms of regulation of sexuality and other things in school that need gender in order to um, be affected. And as I'm arguing here, also are now parasitic on gender in the sense that it's socially legitimate to say, well, boys and girls are different, and so then you can build your racism, right? You know, piggybacking onto that. But so this is to say that I think there, there are instances um, in the schools of very good programs, particularly for um, boys of color and girls of color, like the Harlem Girls School, for example, that really are very thoughtful about um, interrogating the way in which sexism and racism work together. But I will also say that the data shows, as well as you know, other studies, which I have now read 20 years of programs that an incredible amount of regressive theories of gender get bundled into these sex segregated programs for kids of color. So, you know, when when you have these mentoring programs for boys of color, you know, there's just a bunch of sexism that gets in there and the same thing. Reverse anytime we have sex asserted as a distinction, the danger of you know, hegemonic masculinity is being described is um, very acute. And there are not very many programs that are out there on the ground. But, hey, sorry to mm -hmm. All right, and at long last, oh. <laughs> our final speaker. We are very fortunate to have with us um, Professor Bella Walker from the Roger Williams University School of Law, um, who will be talking about uh, whiteness and parenthood, parental status from property rights to fundamental rights. I'm going to have to try to turn that off. Just to oh, just to move There we go. All right. <laughs> um, since, yeah, I still don't have any um, 
exciting clips to show you. Um, the <laughs> <laughs> just stop, you just have to look at me. So, um, so I'm going at, you know, again, we're dealing with children, but kind of a, a different take and kind of a, a looking, stepping back at the origins of some of the things that um, both you know, Mr. Williams or Mr. Williams talked about in, that we see in the schools. And, but I, I teach both property and family law um, and do law and identity. And the property and family law, they have always been very intertwined. Um, and the, the question that my work is dealing with is looking at how, what does the, sort of the property framework tell us about how we see the current interactions and um, between children and parents, but this inherently involves you know, children vis-a-vis um, -vis parents in relation to the state and other bodies. Um, so in looking at the ways um, in which rights to, to children, which are now described sort of in terms of fundamental rights and privacy doctrine as kind of a constitutional issue, have these roots embedded from the property framework. And with that, you know, what does the, the internet interconnection with you know, race and class kind of tell us about uh, what was happening you know, 150 years ago and now you know, what shows about what's happening today. Um, and one you know, sort of smaller question that I'm interested now, looking at now, is sort of how does one kind of personal right to be a parent and the rights of others to this child, you know, including the state or other kinds of relatives or family relations, how does that play out based on the property framework? All right, so that's, that's a very grand theoretical, I'll sort of take, try to unpack a little bit of what I'm talking about. Uh, so, you know, historically, children, um, along with women were considered property of the you know, father, husband, um, again, usually having to be sort of a free white male who has, you know, didn't already have property in himself, but then the rest of the family is property within that. And so you, you know, under English common law, you've got, you know, the father has the right to the custody, labor, services of your child. Um, just like you have those rights to that of your spouse. And so that within that, you know, you had their obligations, you were supposed to provide some, you know, substance for your child, and though, you know, originally only if they weren't able to go out and work for themselves, uh, which they were supposed to be able to do at a pretty young age anyway. But that any sort of labor, anything they got back, you had a right to, you put in these resources and you're supposed to get them back, um, and you had a control over your children and your spouse, um, and both sort of their actions and in their bodily integrity. Um, and same ways in which you, know, a, you could harm, it wasn't something as sort of being able to beat your wife or in terms of being illegal, but that as your property it was both assumed that you wouldn't really do anything that was unnecessary and, you know, any harm you were suffering the damages through anyway. Um, so, which was kind of in our more modern jurisprudence has said, you know, the court says, well, there's a, there's a presumption that fit parents are going to act in their child's best interest so that we presume student parents are making decisions that are for the benefit of their children. Um, currently, you know, not because we currently see them as their property, but they still have a sense of belonging. Um, so we get, you know, in the uh, 1800s, sort of they've got children are, are very clearly property. There are a, they have this legal status underneath their parents. Um, and then in 
kind of the 1940s, or this early period, you get the first states, U.S. Supreme Court cases, which start a lot with the, the school cases of the courts saying you know, parents and also their teachers bring cases against state laws, like you can't teach German in the schools, or you can't have your child, you know, child labor laws and other things like that. Um, and so, you know, at this point, the court says, well, you've got the child's care and custody. Um, so, you know, the custody, care, and nurture of the child reside first in the parents, whose primary function and freedom include preparation for the obligations that the state can either supply nor hinder. So this is the Supreme Court of Princeton, Massachusetts in 1944. Yeah. So they're starting to say there's a it's kind of switch. We're still, children are in your care and custody, but it's not, they're moving, the rhetoric is somewhat changing. Yeah. But it's still this notion of there are these things in this private sphere of the family that the state can't intrude on. Um, and so the, the kind of fundamental rights doctrine, which is how family law now sees the relation between children and parents, is that you have, there's a fundamental right to one's family, which is part of kind of this paradigm of the you know, privacy rights, so that you've got a right to be able to structure your family in certain ways that you see fit, um, which whether you know, it means the right to be able to teach your child what languages you want or to have them participate in your religion, if, you know, if you're Amish, to have them not go to high school, um, if you, you know, want to live in a single family, even if you've got sort of a family size of you know, 10 or whatever, you have the right to do that despite the state laws. So there's these different ones which come in to say, we've got these private realm of the family um, and connected with the other you know, constitutional doctrines around that start with the contraceptive and abortion cases and develop into sort of the things we consider more about sexuality, like Lawrence v. Texas and those are that that's which gets to be sort of this different realm. The sexuality of one's kind of becomes, develops more different in a sort of different space than the family child's centric, but they start out in the same way, that there's this realm of your private world. Um, and so the, then this, you know, so the court says, well, we've got the family's got a privacy interest in the upbringing and education of the child and the intimacies of the marital relationship, which is, protected from the Constitution against un, um, undue state interference. Now, the, and there's a sort of other part of this, though, in that while you've got, say, two, two adults can have this privacy relationship between that the state's seemingly not supposed to interfere with, children, because they are still minors, um, the state has an interest in them nonetheless. And so what we get there is that, you know, well, they say the state doesn't have constitutional control over this parental discretion unless there's some sort of showing your parents unfit or as some statutes say, that, you know, there's physical or mental health is, is jeopardized. And so this is, is sort of the space where the state can be involved in that parental relationship and the way that they're allowed to become it in a way that they couldn't between two, two adults. Um, and as you know, we all know, the state interacts with different people in very different ways um, and with different communities in different ways. Um, so the, the ways in which you know, we see kind of property can affect one's fundamental rights in general, or just for the ways in which the state kind of interacts in more intrusive or less intrusive ways 
are, you know, to the extent that people who have more property, um, whether that literally be um, property in terms of wealth or, you know, property of whiteness, generally are afforded greater protections um, by, by those, you know, by the wealth and the connect those connections. And, you know, as a sort of corollary, people who traditionally had more property rights um, end up with greater fundamental rights as well. Uh, so that, you know, those, those parents who were given greater uh, property rights in their children, those families that were not interfered with. So um, in the US, you know, white upper class families as opposed to you know, families of color or other like European immigrant groups, other parties who were seen as, you know, sort of out of the main body politic. Um, so that these, you know, these fundamental, what we term fundamental rights are sort of end up being accorded in the same way as that we see those who had the property rights previously. Uh, so to, to take this and stand this back to whiteness as property and Cheryl Harris's sort of introduction of the whiteness you know, has these tangible property implications that are created both from legal text and legal action, that this ends up being sort of some usable property enjoyed by a work person by taking care of these privileges. Um, and the, what we see kind of in the development of family law is sort of this extra, extra property rights of sorts helps in the development of kind of what we talk about is, is two, two family laws. And so it's that there's kind of a public family law and a, a private family law, um, which is how you know, a lot of family law scholars talk about it. So that the, the private family law are, you know, occurs with sort of those, those families that are protected more from state intervention. So private family law you know, is the couple divorcing and man and wife going in you know, with their private attorneys to the court and disputing who's going to get custody of this child um, and fighting out amongst themselves and they're you know, given the privacy of their, their family. Um, and the, the public family law is kind of the, the family law that ends up applying to most everybody else, which is the family law, all the people you see in family law court where the, the state has kind of interfered in the family in some way. So this is the, um, you know, the, 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 the mother trying to get her child back from foster care or trying to, you know, some of the juvenile disciplinary hearings, so I would go, goes in too. So that the, the family law that becomes involved in deciding, well, which not, you know, okay, between these two fam these two parties who are gonna argue amongst themselves who's gonna be their child, but what the people having to argue with the state about their rights towards their, their child. Um, let me see what I can get in my last number so. Uh, So the, um, there's sort of, you know, we've got this big public-private divide that people talk about that very much operates based on uh, race and class lines. And the, the pieces that both you know, the other panelists have talked about, about the ways in which different actions in families are viewed based on race, it becomes very present in it. Um, and so one, you know, the place you see this is in children who are taken away by, by the state. Um, and so for children currently 
In foster care, it's estimated you know, about 20% of them at most suffered really, you know, sort of severe physical or um, emotional abuse. So the, the such, you know, there are many situations in which there's clearly action that needs to be done. But the other 80% are in with some sort of ambiguous zone in which decisions were made by somebody of whether these parents were acting in whatever, you know, they were truly behaving as fit parents taking care of their children in different ways. And so, um, and as you all know, those judgments very much are based on the person who's doing the seeing um, and the, you know, and the race of the actors and class of the actors who are doing the action. So we've got these, um, the, the massive sort of state intervention into removing the children from, from these families. Um, and the, you know, sort of the, the, other, the other piece that I was you know, trying to, you know, I'm still, still working through, okay, I'm, I'm out of time. Um, but, oh, sorry, it's all good. Oh, you can <laughs> ask me questions about whatever else. Wrap it up yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, so the um, we you know normally the the right the right to family has kind of comes out of this right to this property in the family, and both are ways of creating protection from from the state interference. So that there are ways you know the benefits and responsibilities and the idea that you sort of get to do what you want to within this sphere. Um, and this, this protection of privacy, you know, in some ways, has worked out very well for, for certain parties. Um, but then left, you know, men, old days, if you were a white male, you could, you know, or most other males, you could beat your wife. And that was, your privacy was protected within that. Um, but there's other, you know, so this, we still have certain amounts of privacy in families, and families which are allowed to do more things, and then other families which have less of this property in their family, and so they're less protected from, from the state interference. Um, so I think, yeah, I'll, that's somewhat of a sum up, and I'll take, take questions, and then I guess I'll have a little bit of time to discuss all of this together. Yeah, we, I guess we when, when do we end? 10.30? 10, 10 oh, 10.30. Okay, so we don't, all right. So, yeah, you can ask a few questions in a few questions. minutes. Yes, sir. So, you know, as you were talking, and the, the idea of the public and the private, um, I want to ask you about the Adrian Peterson case then, right? So you've got the, the private on one hand where he has this relationship with, you know, the, the child's mother and how they've worked out visitation or whatever, but then you've got the Texas statute that that said something about like, you know, disciplining your child to the to the length of what the community deems fit. How mm -hmm. does this community piece come in? That was kind of, you know, the the strange part for I think those of us who who were like, how do you, how right, would right, you right. create that in a in a text of law? This idea of a community, what the community deems appropriate. Yeah, I know it when I see it. Yeah. Right. The, yeah. I, know, right. I don't know. Yeah. Yes. I don't have a definition for pornography. Right. Right. Exactly. Right, so. Yeah. I mean, that's it's sort of the, the perennial question. You don't always have it stated in the, the law explicitly, but it's sort of all these things when you get before a judge, it's the judge's determination of whether they think your actions are appropriate in what others said. So that's, you know, very easily affected by whatever the judge's perceptions are of, you know, themselves, the view of all these other things. Uh, and particularly so much of family law stuff, which isn't, you know, very few of it is actually before the Supreme Court, but it's, be, you know, happening very quickly in these courts where the judges are just making, okay, well, yeah, you, you know, you obviously, you don't behave appropriately, then we're not going to protect that. Um, and, yeah, I mean, what the community Deems fit. Obviously, that that changes based on time and based on whoever's getting to decide what the community is thinking at that point. Um, you know, corporal corporal punishment is allowed you know, in 
by, by parents in all, all 50 states. Um, in about 20 states, corporal punishment is allowed in public schools, okay. um, which, you know, given what you guys were talking about, is another sort of troublesome thing because it's just another form of discipline and punishment that's meted out in discriminatory ways. Um, the, you know, normally the standard is that you're allowed to do it for purposes of discipline. You know, you're not supposed mm -hmm. to do it just for like, you know, sadism or something of that sort of that it's, you're supposed to believe that it has, it is for the benefit of the child as opposed to merely being punitive. Right. Um, but again, you know, that's, that's very relative of what, I mean, parents always have to like make different decisions about what they think is going to actually be a useful experience for their child to get something out of. Um, and yeah, I mean, I don't, you know, I haven't, I haven't really looked much into the case like I've heard about in the general news. I haven't looked into the specifics. Um, it does, I guess, I think the child was, was taken in with like severe wounds yeah. to the, um, yeah. which, mm -hmm. you know. The right. Mother, didn't the, it was the mother who was the mother. The child. Yeah. She, yeah. Well, he, the child was still in um, Adrian's custody, so he took him in to see the doctor. He called, he texted um. the mother about the incident. Um, I did have a, a, a complaint yeah, yeah, yeah. Of, of this idea of whiteness of property and family law and this like recent abundance of white women adopting black children like their handbags. Mm -hmm. How, within that practice of like, how is, how is that being characterized as far as the family law where, um, is there, is there still a conversation about what it means for, you know, for a family to adopt a child of another race and um, the talking about the best interest of the child or has the conversation moved to, we just need to get these children homes and we're happy to place them wherever? I mean, there's definitely a conversation happening. It's just, you know, not everybody's having it. Some okay. like there's certainly the conversations being had. Um, the you know in terms of just like doctrinally under the law, you're not supposed to make any determinations about like custody or adoption based on race. This you know sort of can come in in other other factors. Um, and yet I, we don't see we don't see Kevin Hart with a white baby. Right. I would love to see that. Well, yes, yes. So that's <laughs> the, right, right, right. He's Nobody, adopted, he's he has not. five children, but I just really want him to like adopt a white child and then let's have this conversation yeah. about how starting yeah. that would be <laughs> to people. Right, right. And I mean, I think the thing like that, there's so many children in, in foster care who aren't leaving foster care. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they just sort of like, the older you are and the darker your skin is, the worse chance you have of getting into adoption. Mm -hmm. um, so the vast majority, you know, particularly like if once you're over five or six, um, particularly if you're a boy of color, like your chances of getting adopted are not very good. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a lot of arguments about kind of like the but that's adoption not adoption provisions that are trying to encourage people being taken, you know, to finalization of the ter termination of parental rights. Right. Um, I was going to just jump in, but that's not who she was referring. Like that's not those are not no, the no, babies no, 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 that no. are adopted, right? Like that's like if that's not Angelina Jolie is not bringing in home, um, yes, you know, a, a, right, right, exactly. right, right, right. Yeah, I mean, I guess I was sort of taking it's more. Yeah, right. this is just me going more about to the things that I was. <laughs> Oh. Yeah. But, oh. I was just going to say, I, I, this is sort of my personal like issue, I'm a transracial, transnational adoptee, so when you think of like the whole framework of whiteness as property and you look at adoption, I mean you start with your premise of, you know, children are property and the right. state gets right. to decide what's in their best interest, but if you look at it even like just globally, how that power structure plays out of who gets to be the adoptor right. and, and what's deemed to be in the child's best interest, like it was in 
my best interest to be taken from my country, lose my family, lose my language, and be brought here. And you know, perhaps, <laughs> but but there's just so many ways that dynamic dynamic plays out in and in, in adoption disruption, children who are sent back, put back into foster care, put back into the adoption system, the degree of physical and sexual abuse that occurs within adoptive homes that are never looked at again, and accusations are not believed. You know, there's just so many layers, and then, and you go even just to identity issues, like as an adoptee in a, in a white family, you get to sort of pass and have um, all the privilege of, many of the privileges of being white for a significant period of your life until you go out into the world and people no longer see you within your white family. And, I mean, there's so many ways yeah, that... Yeah, <laughs> right. I mean, I guess just sort of bring it into like two, you know, small movement of property. I mean, first, it's just, you know, the, the adoption market is pretty crazy. Like, um, Patricia Williams and other written about just kind of, like the pricing systems when you go for adoption. And then it's cheaper to buy a child of color, or, you know, to, right. to adopt, you go in, the, the fees are less. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. And the argument being they're trying harder to find more families for, so, um, but I mean the other the other sort of piece that it interested me in him dealing with, and this is Gail going back to the U.S. foster care because that was what I was looking at, is the ways in which kind of children's property correlates to children's fundamental rights to the extent that parents have these rights in their children, the children don't necessarily have the same right to their parents. You know, a child doesn't have the right to see their parent if the state decides to take them away from foster care or whatever. And the child also doesn't necessarily it doesn't have a right to see like their sibling or a right to other people in the community or to their other family members. So once you terminate the parental rights, then yeah, you can get taken off to somewhere else and other people within, you know, your your grandmother who may be the one who raised you anyway it doesn't have like a clear right in the same way that a parent does to have you, you know, bring you back and take you out of that foster care system. Once you're once the parents leave those, lose those, you know, rights, then the, the child is sort of, doesn't have any rights that they can assert against others. Mm -hmm. you know. But in, so, yeah. in terms of the um, international adoption, um, I mean, the p position in, in the Hague Convention is that it's strongly discouraged. And I guess the rationale behind that is, you know, the, everyone has a right to their identity, their ethnic background, and racial identity. Mm -hmm. And I think it becomes, a, I guess it's a little bit more complicated when you think about it domestically, like what sort of right to, you know, identity does you know, African American have? And mm -hmm. how, how, how does that, should that factor in um, within, within a country? But I know internationally, you know, it's generally discouraged, you know. I know mm -hmm. even though people like Angelina Jolie do it, um, I mean, I, I think the position is that you probably shouldn't um, do it because even if you are uh, giving an individual child access to more uh, privileges and, and rights, um, which you're also removing them. And it, you'll see this when, once you reach the age of majority in terms of you know having sort of the identity crisis, you're also removing them from their culture and from yeah. um, you know, where they belong. But if you if you say that to the adopting people, I mean, it's a, you know it's that same power structure, right? The, the people who are in charge of, or the people who are most influential in writing about um, transracial and transnational adoption tend to be people who are white and well educated and wealthy, and and actually even now the people who are primarily able to adopt internationally have changed from when when I was adopted uh, because it's become now so expensive that it's. You know, I we wor I work with children um, who are adopted, at, you know, in a different relationship now. But they're being adopted by very wealthy families, and their experience is very different. But um, it's really it's hard not for me to not see it as we as white Americans are going over to um, second world, third world countries and buying children because although it's perfectly fine for me to adopt a black baby from Africa, I can't. Right. <laughs> yeah, I'm doing that here domestically. Right. So, but yeah, I mean, I've I've always said that like if if we could just turn the tables and have children from the United States being adopted overseas or black mm -hmm. families adopting white babies, uh, the whole di the whole dialogue would just it come would. to a screeching halt. And you know, that is a privilege of whiteness, like to say that yeah. be, have 
belonging to a white American family trumps all the other things that you would have had in your own country. I mean, there are other reasons of poverty and, and not having, you know, care and foster homes, but it is, that's the conversation because a lot of times African American families who try those same processes internationally and, and in the States have a much more difficult time, mm -hmm. right, than even right. at this point, like the single white woman who wants, who wants to adopt. I'm not Did you see that case that just got filed about the woman with the, who, who was suing the sperm bank in uh, Yes, they yes. brought it up yeah. at another, um, I hadn't heard of it, but they brought it up at another. Um, they're, they're, right, but yeah, but there's also, I mean, there have been a bunch of cases happening over the, you know, mm -hmm. past like decades or two. I haven't noticed. I thought several years ago it's a black family that adopted a white child up in, I believe, Northern USA, and sort of their just interaction, their interface with the you know the world around them, and constantly being stalked and harassed, and having their child asked, "Are you okay?" when their parents are right there, and yeah, lots and lots of intervention, and um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. If y'all want to Google it, it's pretty basic, just like black family adopts white child. <laughs> 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 yeah. Another thing that was interesting to me because I grew up in a minor like a minority neighborhood is in five like five percent white kids and it changed a lot of who I identify with, who I trust instinctively, who I you know, how I behave. And this this little girl growing up in a black community um, you know, I think in some of these articles, if you dig around, they start talking about how she sees herself and who she, you know, who she navigates towards and, um, yeah, feels comfortable with when she has the, the option of engaging mm -hmm. different types of people. Hmm. Can I ask you a question? Because when you were talking about the, um, I have, so you said you were writing a book? You've already I written a book know, on the same it's, it's um, under review at the public. So you had you had made mention when you were talking about the whole boy crisis mm -hmm. and some of the um, solutions that 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 that, yeah. that they're pushing are would be gender I guess gender division in education yeah. and I, I just I guess for me I was curious because um, I, I had thought that from the, the viewpoint of girls that there was a benefit to. To, um, or that some research has shown that girls perform better in math and sciences when they are in a same-sex classroom. Um, and anecdotally, I, I have many friends who um, got scholarships or you know, didn't have money but ended up going to all girls' schools and said like they thought that it was a much better environment for them. So kind of curious, um, because you seem very um, opposed to splitting the genders, is the impact from, from what you're seeing the same not the same, but you know, is, is it similarly damaging to boys and girls, um, or sort of how is? Yeah, <laughs> good question. So you know, I didn't. My comments are directed towards what's happening, not what mm -hmm. could happen. So I don't want to make any kind of blanket or principled argument about what's possible in sex segregated. But I can speak to what's actually happening. So um, what's actually happening on the ground in um, numerous single-sex environments across the country, which has been documented by the ACRU, and they have a, a new program called Teach Kids Not Stereotypes, is rampant sex role stereotyping that is affecting girls and boys. Now, um, you know, I did also mention a school like the Harlem Girls School. That's a wonderful school that is not doing the stereotyping that's happening in many, many other small sex programs. The question, though, is, which is painful to ask, is how much all this sexual stereotyping is being um, given a free pass by people, you know, who that the one good school is standing in for the hundred bad ones. Mm -hmm. And what um, regulations are in place and what enforcement mechanisms for those regulations are in place to make sure that we um, don't have the situation we have now, which is one you know, or two or three national leading lights becoming a cover mm -hmm. for hundreds and hundreds of 
a poem <laughs> program. Yeah. So that's where my um, this comes from. That's one thing. The second thing I'll say, which is more controversial, but it's like people like being in segregated environments. You know, people that go, go to, I mean, I'm sorry, but you know, people that go to all women's colleges love that. But you know what? White people that had the state enforcing laws that kept people, they like to choose. So <laughs> liking segregation is not an argument in favor of it. Now, what the data show is that women Girls and women in single-sex environments do very well. But you know what the data shows? Girls do better than boys no matter what, whether they're sitting right next to them or they're in a whole other school. That is very clear. Is there data showing that single for girls single-sex is better than co-ed? Not good data. There is just not. The Department of Education under Bush, who wanted to press this in 2005, did a meta-analysis of all existing research on single sex ed, they started with a universe of like 2,500 published studies. They then began to apply standard um, criteria to assess the validity of the research so they could whittle it. So they went down from 2,500 cases to under 40 <laughs> that they could even keep. And those were not good studies. They were just better than all the others. And they were indeterminate. You know, now, it is very hard to measure because you can't, the controls are very difficult when you're talking about education. But there's clearly evidence of the harms because there's clear evidence of the sexual stereotyping. What there is not is clear evidence of the benefits. That's where we're at in the present. Did, they, did any of the studies look at race then as well? Like, was it sort of equally indeterminate? Definitely. Or? So, right, and there has been, so there's a really great um, professor of education at NYU named Pedro Nogueira, who's been very upfront on these issues, and he's been doing a lot of studies of uh, single-sex programs for boys of color, for black and Latino boys in the New York mm -hmm. area. And, um, you know, what he is finding is that if you control for the extra resources that are putting into these programs, the quality of the teaching, the sex segregation is not much of a value add. But, you know, he's also interrogating specifically the, the account of um, gendered racism, you know, mm -hmm. that's being addressed. And, and he's not saying that it's not productive to say to young black men, you know, you're being targeted in very specific ways. Your whiteness wants to criminalize black masculinity. Okay, that can make a difference. Now, why a black girl can't be sitting next to a black boy when that's said, that's the problem. We don't have that evidence. We just don't have it. So that needs to be said. We need to critique, you know, gendered racism, but we don't need to segregate. In, order to, in fact, the segregation itself may be enabling mm -hmm. in certain ways. That's the, that's the issue. I also had a follow-up question for you. So do you think that the um, the attention to white boys and the needs of white boys is really an outgrowth of the school shootings that were taking place in the late 90s? So like Columbine, Paducah, a number, I mean basically school shootings had been taking place across the country, but they were predominantly in urban settings with um, kids of color, and so there hadn't been an outcry. It was really, it's only really when white kids get shot that we care. Um, but is that kind of why the idea that that it was like white boys were doing these things? I mean, they, they yeah, have been overcompensation. Or so we needed yeah. to, or we need to intervene because is that? I mean, is that sort of no. what? No. <laughs> yeah. No. Because we know that because I mean, first of all, it's a great question, but it's like that happened in the 1990s. You know, it keeps happening here now, 2014, and right. every time it's like, oh, I, w I wonder what's going on. You know, there's. The, the interventions around the boy crisis are not about addressing the way in which white male privilege creates an entitlement to violence. Mm -hmm. That is like completely mm -hmm. not, it's, not it's, 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 to me, yeah. it's just, it's a, in the United States in particular, it is, you know, primarily an anti-feminist backlash. And that, you know, so the book Backlash comes out in 1991, so this starts to up. Now, the thing is, whiteness, you know, is part of male supremacy. I mean, this, this is what I'm saying about the intersectionality. 
Okay, so I do definitely think that we have to account for other formations besides feminism in producing this um, panic about the diminishing value of white male privilege. But that's really what I think is going on with the boy crisis, and I think that feminists make a mistake if they think of it only in terms of an anti-feminist backlash, because they have to see that you know, the feminist assault on, on male privilege is an assault on white male privilege. So they just have to see how all of this stuff is working together. Thank you. And an assault on white heterosexual male well, privilege. Yeah. For sure. Right. If we for look sure. back at the beginning of right. common schools, this whole idea of education making you effeminate, right? The, exactly. The feminization and of boys through education. So I, I, again, your yeah. idea of the intersectional nature of, of that problem is really interesting. But I appreciate that. And I mean, this is the question we have to ask of programs like My Brother's Keeper and you know, even very progressive programs that want to address the crisis facing boys of color is, you know, is there any understanding of the heteronormativity that is being built into this resuscitation of minoritized and dominant masculinities? Because a lot of these costs of, you know, the, these single-sex programs where, you know, they're like, look, we got to really restore a sense of um, dignity and pride in, you know, boys of color. Right that understanding of what being a strong black man looks like mm -hmm. as it's as it's True. being taught to these kids is so homophobic mm -hmm. you know and and that you know we got to the 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 um, gender heterogeneity in the classroom also can mitigate can not always but can mitigate the the um, homophobic constructions of masculinity Thank you. Thank hey, you. thank you. <laughs>